Not all bugs are bad, but in general there are some that we think of as being bad bugs because they, they eat our plants that we want to harvest from, they reduce our yield, they uh, create some kind of bad impact on our, on our crops. But there are also good bugs, obviously, in the environment. Um, bees uh, that pollinate our crops, uh, beetles that go out and eat weed seeds or are natural enemies of, of our crop pests. So I think it's more about creating an a ecosystem on your farm that the, the bad bugs can be kept in check by the good bugs and also creating an environment where the good bugs can do the things that are beneficial to the farm. But, um, but my main goal is to grow food for our students and for the uh, staff members who live here. So in order to make that happen, we have six acres of certified organic vegetables. We do grow a lot of fruiting um, plants and often they need pollinators to, to set really healthy fruit. So um, we try to just create a diverse environment so that um, all kinds of uh, insect species can, can thrive here. One of our key missions here on the farm is to grow food. And so that needs to be kind of at the forefront of our minds as we're trying to you know, maximize our yield try to have really healthy plants, have really healthy, uh, healthy food that we're able to grow here. The beetle banks started primarily from a, a need to address the Colorado potato beetles. And they can uh, really demolish a whole field pretty quickly to a point where you walk out there and it just looks like uh, some green stems sticking out of the ground. And so my role a lot of times was walking the rows of potato uh, in the potato field and going out spotting the little potato bugs and then squishing them. You get to the end of the row and your hands are all kind of this uh, grimy, orange mud kind of mix. Um, so I was looking for any opportunity to try to not do that anymore. For our money, if we can put in this habitat and establish it and just give these beetles a little place to live, they can greatly reduce all those costs to the farm. Land that's not very productive for us and has challenges with cultivation or for whatever reason is, is ideal land to put into pollinator habitat. We started with a, about a, a half acre piece and, um, and that was just really erosive land for us. So I farmed it for years and, and after a big rain I'd, I'd come out to the farm and often I'd see how much soil had moved and it just really you know, was, was soul crushing. I don't want to go back to farming this land, what else am I going to do? And, uh, and then decided to put it into uh, pollinator habitat. Um, so there's just, you know, different ways that you can, can provide resources to the pollinators. They require so little, you don't, you don't have to like, it's not like having the cows or the pigs, you don't have to check their water every day, you don't have to clean out their pens or anything like that. All you have to do is provide them some habitat and they take care of the rest. We put that in seven years ago and it's just been the very best thing that we've ever done. Um, it's really stabilized that hillside, uh, encourages lots of diverse insect life, and it's just beautiful. We have kind of four chunks of beetle banks. They're all about five feet wide, um, and they are, there's two that are about 300 feet long, and then there's two that are behind us that are maybe like 400, 425 feet long. We just give them a little bit of space to live, and within that little habitat, they'll actually go out into the crop fields and they'll eat weed seeds, they will attack crop pests, and specifically in this field, we're mostly targeting the potato beetle. In addition to beetles, uh, we included uh, native wildflowers in this mix too, to create habitat for pollinating species, uh, wild bees, uh, parasitic wasps, things like that, that can also be beneficial for, as natural enemies, but also as uh, pollinators for our crops. I look around and all I see is corn and soybeans, and I see robust diversity here and I think if, if I were a, an insect, if I were a pollinator, like this is for sure where I would be. And just to know that there's room for beauty in a farm that's also focused on productivity, I think that that's, that's important spiritually, psychologically, um, to make room for, for the things that we don't eat. It's a much better place to work when you come here and you can see uh, flowers blooming and, and grasses that have been in this environment for tens of thousands of years. To see that they're back here on this farm alongside some of our more modern agricultural practices, I think just makes, just makes it a good place to be, it makes it a good place to work. Don't be intimidated, just do it, and look for the uh, less productive parts of your, of your fields. If you have um, edges that are just really problematic, that's a good place to look. 
just taking little pockets that you feel like you're not really able to be super productive as a, as a uh, food producer there and see the opportunity to create beneficial space for, uh, for insects on the farm. Reach out for help. You know, PFI has great resources, Xerxes has great resources. The Xerxes Society and their staff, um, as well as all of their printed publication resources, were really helpful to, to think about the design of this, what are the species we should include, um, how to design this structure where there's, a sh there's tall stature plants and short stature plants, uh, what's the best way to maintain them. There's an investment here in, in labor to maintain them, to establish them, to manage weeds over time, um, but overall it's a long-term investment in the farm. When you're dealing with prairie, you got to take the long view. You can't think about what's happening next month. You got to think five or ten years in a, you know, into the future. Try not to judge for five years, and then after five years, take a look, and and I suspect that you'll be happy that you did what you did.